Hey everyone, it's David here, and I want to thank you for tuning into this video, which is going to be kind of a crash course into uh, creating liquid sims with RealFlow. I wanted to create this particular video just so that if you're interested in taking part of my breakdowns of the alphabet videos that you may or may not have seen, um, I wanted you to be able to kind of lay a foundation so that you grasp or so that you've seen the process from start to finish because uh, the other videos I want to keep them short and sweet and they might not go into you know like the whole flow of things um, so I wanted to create this um, this one to kind of show you the whole process and I still want to keep it short and sweet but it's definitely going to be longer it's probably going to be an hour or so um, where I show you from start to finish how to take an animation from your 3D app into RealFlow, uh, what to consider. I want to show you how to set up collisions, forces, and how to gradually uprest the sim and to work with RealFlow in order to write out your simulation data. Then we're going to take a look at meshing uh, and tweaking that. And then we're going to see how to preview simulations in RealFlow and how to uh, do preview renders inside a real flow and then just uh, taking a look at how to uh, export the final mesh in order so that we can so that we can um, render it in our 3d app so it's it's going to be like a, a glance over uh, quite a few of the topics and i hope that you uh, are able to follow along and if there's anything you thought i uh, browse through too quickly then feel free to let me know uh, in the comments below or via Twitter at Dave Splinning uh, or uh, via Gmail DaveSplinning at gmail.com. It did turn out into a pretty long one uh, so use the chapter markers below in the description if you want to uh, jump between the, the different sections or rewatch uh, section. I'm excited to talk to you about RealFlow today. It's always been around, as long as I've been doing CG at least, and it was probably one of the first apps that uh, lets you uh, simulate liquids in CG, at least for those of us who weren't geniuses enough to write our own simulation frameworks. Uh, I think I tried it the first time around 15 years ago, and it fascinated me straight away, and I've always, I've always uh, kept it around. I've, I've been doing a fair amount of work in it, and I've always thought it was one of the more approachable ways to to get up to speed and do liquid sim and uh, a really potent software really and obviously I mean there's different softwares there's Houdini there's uh, Phoenix and uh, other plugins that can do uh, liquids but uh, let's not get into uh, a discussion about what's the better solution let's uh, learn a way to get quickly up to speed and experiment with simulations in CG. So without further ado, let's get into uh, an overview of the UI and setting up our first project. So obviously, if you've been doing any CG work previously, uh, you're going to know your way around the software pretty much, or it's going to appear pretty familiar to you. You have your shelves up hand in the window. Uh, create your three different types of liquids and your demons, your geometry, uh, object dynamics, where you can set up fracturing, things like that, meshing your simulations, display tools. Uh, this is some pretty specific things we don't really need to go into yet and render so there's also a render engine built in which we'll also get to a bit later it's uh, worth pointing out that whatever you do up here in the shelves can also be done easily by going to for example edit add you can create anything you create from the shelf you can create up here from the same categories you can also when you're in the relationship editor you can hit tab and you can browse your way to the different types of objects and you can also type to search much like you're used to from let's say if you've been using Nuke or uh, any other type of node-based software that has that, uh, that functionality. So set a stage we have the viewport it should behave pretty much like you're used to from any other app in terms of orbiting, panning, dollying. If it doesn't 
you can go to file preferences and set it up to to act as Lightwave Cinema, Max, Maya, XSI, Houdini, whatever. Um, you have the possibility on the top hand of any pane, you can close it, you can maximize, minimize, much like you used to, you can maximize it or you can split it so you can either split into vertical horizontal or quad just like you can do in Maya or any other type of software typically I don't really do that though uh, and I don't want to spend too much time teaching you how to dock windows and things like that because I think you'll be able to figure that out yourselves uh, what I do do instead is use the one two three and four buttons to just jump between top front side and perspective uh, because I, I like to keep things maximized and get uh, some some you know g get this this as zoomed in as I can and as precise as I can let's say I want to position in a ground plane here um, but I'll get more into that when we set up our very specific project. Other than that, pretty standard viewport. I um, guess one of the differences is the time code, the frame, and the simulation time down here. We can look at that when we start simulating. Uh, you have a toolbox on, on the left-hand side. I don't typically use it. Uh, I will show you how it correlates to other features in the program because anything you can do up here uh, is usually available at some other place in the UI. What you have on the right hand side is nodes, which works like the outliner, like an object list, whatever you're used to, whatever you create gets populated in here, regardless of the type of object. And when you select it, you get the options on the right hand side. So this should all appear pretty familiar to you. On the right uh, lower corner, we have the relationship editor. So whatever you create gets populated in here as well. But this is not just an overview of what you have in your scene. This is the way you interact and uh, and determine which object should interact which, with each other and which should not. Um, so this is just where you connect your hierarchies and the way things are going to operate. Bottom end of the screen, timeline, some simulate reset buttons which are very important and I'll get to that in a bit bunch of tools down here playback controls keyframing uh, some options some sending to farm things like that we'll get to those as we see the need to just so that we don't spend any more time than we have to here it's important to know that these are drop downs you can probably tell by the arrow but it's easy to overlook the fact that you might need to go, let's say, when you set up your project, you want to make sure, for example, that your simulation is set to the same FPS that the animation you exported from your outside 3D package. So you want to go into simulation, options, and set the FPS output here, for example. And then we have uh, individual options for the different solvers, which we'll get back to at a later stage. So that's a bit, so it's just easy to miss that they're down there. Timeline with its, all its uh, ins and outs we'll get to when we start simulating. You should also be aware of the messages window, which is more like more or less like a log, a script output of what's going on in your scene, which should be pretty familiar to you. Uh, I use this a lot, especially in the later stages of setting up a sim when you're getting specific and uh, you might not get the fastest feedback in the viewport, so you really need to figure out what you're doing then this is a big help for you. And there's a lot, obviously, of different windows uh, adherent to other functionality. The export central we'll probably get to. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's enough f for now, I would say, that you more or less just get a feel for the UI as a whole, and you can follow along as I, as I set up a new project similar to the one that I have uh, prepared here. Okay, so first things first, when you come into RealFlow, you'll be greeted by this dialog here. Much like in any other app, what you might be used to is disabling this. Well, in Real RealFlow you can't, because even if we're used to being able to jump straight into viewport, and I could even, you know, cancel out of this and start setting things up here, uh, and then starting to work. 
that's not the nature of how RealFlow operates. Since simulations do get pretty dense pretty fast, we need to define where we want to save things on drive. Because as soon as we want to start calculating the liquid, we want to save out uh, cache frame by frame as we're going along. There's no preview or anything like that. It's like if you want to see the liquid working, you're going to simulate. And simulate means caching, and caching means saving to drive. So the first thing you should do is set up a product. If you already have a product set up, you get a pretty easy over overview here. You can see the type of functionality with these little icons, which we'll get more into in detail later. Uh, or you can just browse to them on drive if you haven't opened them on this computer yet. Uh, creating a new product, obviously. and learn where you can open templates to kind of try to reverse engineer and see how they set up different types of products in RealFlow. So we're going to set up our first product here. Uh, what I want to do first of all, which is easy to overlook, click the folder icon here if you want to browse. Otherwise just type your 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 search path, but I, I like to click that folder icon. And this is the place where I keep my sandbox projects. Uh, so ignore the fact that it's called cache, that has nothing to do with the functionality. So where's the product going to be and what's the product going to be called? I'm just going to call it first for now. And then you can select a template if you want to. I typically don't, but if the use case matches close to what I see, then maybe I'll give it a go. But in this case, empty. So create new product. And that created our new product for us. So you look up here and you see the search path. And I also want to go into the drive of that in the folder. And I want to see that we have first and then first.fLw. This is the product file. So whenever you like you want to iterate uh, and version up, for example, or save with a comment, you do uh, that that applies to the product file and not the product name. You don't want to create uh, another instance of your product just because you changed some settings, right? So, um, that's where you set that up. And it's pretty empty here, but there are going to be folders popping up as soon as we start simulating. So we're going to do that now. Um, first thing first, we're going to create a liquid. I'm just going to do standard particles now. Um, it is the one that's been around for the longest. I'm going to get into the ins and outs of the different types at a later stage, but it's the easiest one to set up. Uh, I mean, it has its limitations compared to the newer ones, but it also has its perks. But like I said, the main thing with standard particles, it's easy to set up. So if I just click that emitter, I create a circle emitter. All of these are emitters. That's it. Then I can just hit simulate and it's going to start churning out particles for me. Let's take a closer note of what happens when you create objects in the scene. Obviously, uh, the liquid is spewing straight out and it's traveling as if it was uh, we were in outer space. Obviously, we want some gravity in this case. So we go to the demons tab. Demons are what you're probably used to referring as fields or forces uh, from other from other circumstances. But in real foil they're called demons. So we're going to create a gravity demon. I want you to pay, pay attention to what happens down here when I click gravity. Gravity is added to the scene and it's connected by default to this hub01 node. You'll see in the object list there's no hub01. Hub01 is just there in order to to make sure that uh, any object created is connected and it's going to interact with each other. And RealFlow knows pretty much how these objects need to interact with each other. So you shouldn't have any difficulties uh, in a basic case uh, from, uh, from doing this. So re remember what I said about uh, simulating and writing files to disk. You, you saw that when I, r when I clicked simulate, I started getting particles. I can scrub in my timeline now. You see the yellow frames. What actually happened, if we look in the folder now, you see I have, I've gotten several folders. A lot of them are empty, they're just created by default. But if I go to the particles one, you see that I have, oh, this is actually um, associated with my media player right now, because it's a bin file. That's the file format of the emitter. Um, but uh, you can see circle one dot frame number dot bin. And you're going to see that there's 55 files. Surprise, surprise, 55 frames have been cached. 
So what does that mean? Well, if I change something now, if I were to move my emitter, and I can just move my emitter with the standard keyboard shortcuts that I'm used to, the W key, uh, the E key to rotate, or you just use the tools up here, they correlate perfectly. Now, if I were to stand at, say, frame, you see nothing changed, because the information of where those particles are, those are saved to disk. And if I want that to take effect into the particles, I need to simulate again. And if I press simulate now, you see I'm at frame 19, it's going to ask me, do you really want to take the info from frame 19 and continue at frame 20 with overriding the cache? If I press yes now, it's going to start simulating and it's going to overwrite and then we we effectively have created a glitch. You see that uh, the initial particles are still there, this little liquid turd in space, and then the new particles are emitted. And they all, I mean, if we would have had a collider here, they would have all collided together on the ground plane. So let's add a collider. And let's think about this for a sec. Obviously, we don't want to, um, we don't want to simulate and then move the emitter and then simulate again. Obviously, if we wanted the emitter to move between frames, we would be keyframing the emitter. So that's not the proper way to do things. The proper way, if you want to start over, is to at least make sure you go to frame zero and sim again. It's still asking me, though, if I'm sure I want to overwrite. So I'm going to frame, I don't know, 23, uh, and I'm stopping the simulation again. You can see, even though I have 50 frames here, I went to frame th 23. Let's see. We only have 23 frames here, but if we click this little guy, Update Timeline Cache, you'll see that the timeline is now populated up until 25. We can play back, we see the sim we're expecting, and then, boom, we're back to the initial simulation. So it's worth taking note that if you don't overwrite, if you don't simulate over those frames, they're still going to be there. So let's say you uh, initially simulated uh, 150 frames of something, you ended up shortening the frame range to 100, and you were completely happy with the sim, you don't simulate any extra frames because that's just time wasted, and then you render, and then when you start rendering you realize, well oh, maybe I want to render 10 frames more as a handle, then all of a sudden you're rendering that old simulation again, so you get the glitch back. So what you want to do, uh, either you make sure you just cache over, you just sim over all of the frames, or you can just remove the files from disk. You typically don't need to do that, but if you if you really want to get rid of everything, you can clean a data folder. But that, you should be aware of, cleans everything. So let's not do that for now. Let's just reset the timeline. That removes them from memory in here. They are still on disk. And then we're going to simulate. And this time they're going to collide with the ground plane because, remember, uh, it automatically sets up the collisions for us when we create new objects in the scene. I'm just going to let it run past the previous point. So that's the way you actually execute the simulation and make things starting to interact with each other inside of RealFlow. You probably want to learn the keyboard shortcuts for those as well. Uh, so you'll, you've will probably seen me already starting the sim without clicking the button, and that's the A key, I guess, A for action. Uh, so you can press A to uh, start the sim, press A to stop it again, so it's like a toggle. And then the reset button, Control A, brings up this dialog. And then you obviously can press Y, or you can actually just use the space bar, which is a lot closer at hand. Uh, you probably have your thumb on there, as I do right now because the S key is uh, highlighted, so Control A, space, and then A again. You'll see me doing that maneuver a lot of times, so it's good that you're aware of what I'm doing. So that's pretty much our, our, like, our basic setup, if you will. I'm gonna create a new project now, and we're gonna set something up similar to the, to the first example that I had on screen. And this time, we're going to get some data from our 3D app. So let's just take a quick glance at that, because it's, it's uh, of course, handy to know how to do that. 
So we have our first product or second product set up. And now let's take a look at a more common flow of things from start to finish uh, in a simple case. I want to use uh, mocap data this time. So I'm going to jump into Maya because this one I don't have in Alembic or anything like that, which is capable with uh, RealFlow can, can load in your Alembic files. But we need to open this FBX inside of Maya and um, just export it as a format that RealFlow understands. So I'm just going to, uh, first of all, um, group this and scale it down just so that so that uh, it's, it's more... Um, I mean, scaling is always an issue, and it's something you need to be aware of. A scale unit inside of uh, RealFlow, one unit is going to be one meter, and it's good to like I mean even if even if you have it in centimeters, just make sure that uh, it, it matches up. I mean, you could obviously scale it afterwards in RealFlow, and you could whatever figure out some kind of conversion pipeline. I don't care. Just be aware that um, the one unit in RealFlow uh, is equal to one meter physically. That's uh, a good starting point because otherwise all of your settings are going to be off. So in this case, I have this dancer type animation here. I obviously downloaded this from Mixamo, which is where I get a lot of my just kind of sandbox animation things, which is really nice just to get some motion inside of your projects and make them more organic just inside of just draw instead of just dropping spheres in a tank or something like that, which just gets old looking at. Uh, I have f uh, 500 uh, frames, 0 to 4 499. I have 24 FPS. I'm just going to select the geo. Yes, that's right, the geo and not the rig because uh, it, it's just going to capture the deformed geometry. And it's, uh, I mean, nowadays this is not a big deal. But back in the day, uh, it was pretty painstaking if you had to try to export, let's say, a rigged animation from one app to another. So it was great to be able to take whatever, regardless of how you achieved the look of the geometry, you could export it with the RealFlow uh, exporter. So this is the RF Connect uh, plugin inside of Maya, and there are uh, plugins available for all of the major apps. Um, I'm just going to point to where I want to put it, and obviously that's inside of my project. And I will put it in my second and in my, it's actually going to be in my objects folder. Let me just see my frame so I got a folder. Um, and I say capo era and just give it a version number in case something goes wrong with the export and I need to come back and hit export. And then playback range is fine. Export selected, yes, and not the whole scene. Export deformation is important because otherwise it only gives you transformation. And then I'm gonna export. I'm just gonna run through your whole sim and export a scene data file, which is uh, RealFlow's native object cache uh, format. And that's all I need to do in Maya for now. We might come back here uh, if we wanna render uh, something later on. Um, I'm just going to reset and hit the import object. And before I do that, I happen to know in the back of my head that my product right now is set to 25 frames. So before I import it in case there's any conversion kicking in or anything, just to be sure, I want to set it to 24, which is the same as my animation. Obviously, if you're creating the whole scene inside of RealFlow, you don't need to be too concerned about this. But in my case, I just want to make sure. So there we go. We have our character. I'm going to instantly select. Uh, it so happens that the joints and the surface are different objects on this character. That doesn't matter at all to RealFlow. Uh, so we can keep them like that. We don't need to combine or anything. When you want to select multiple objects and edit attributes at the same time, you can. As you see, it's at multiple nodes selected. Obviously, if you select different types, then you're not going to be able to set the gravity strength on a on a collider object, for example. But I just want to bring a less colorful preview here. And uh, we're ready to start setting up the particles. It did give us a camera anyway. I really don't need that camera, so I'm just going to delete it. Um, 
and you'll see that she is about well maybe she got a little short or she could be she could be slightly shorter than average I mean she could be one and a half meters tall and you see her going on for 499 frames uh, and the timeline was extended to that when I brought her in I'm just gonna make sure that I extend the work area as well to 499 here we go. And what I want to do now is I want to set up a tank for her to kind of dance within. So some liquid is going to slosh around as she does her moves. In order to do that, this time, I'm not going to use the standard particles. I'm going to use Diverso. Diverso is uh, the newest addition to the solvers of liquid inside RealFlow. And it's uh, abbreviated DY, so anytime you create an emitter, you'll see DY emitter, uh, which is good to be aware of. I guess the reason it's called Diverso is because it is pretty diverse. It uh, can hold many different types of particles. So you have your position-based dynamic liquid, you have your smoothed particle hydrodynamics liquid, which is akin to the standard particles. Um, you have dumb particles, which is like your particles in particular or Maya. Uh, without, uh, without you know the the liquid tension and forces between particles like that, and then you have granular, viscous, viscoelastic, rigid, and elastic, and we might uh, visit some of those use cases later. But now let's just go by liquid PDB. It's a pretty much the most straightforward one to just get a a liquid going pretty fast. And then we need to define for the emitter. Uh, I created a square emitter, but honestly, that's not what we're going for in this case. We want to define a volume that she's going to be, you know, dancing in. So I'm going to create a cube for that. And this is where I use the one key to, first of all, figure out how big do I want that domain to be. Let's just scrub through and see how far does she actually move. Seems to me like this area here should be fine. So 4x4 four four, um, should be fine. I already know uh, that she is one and a half, uh, roughly, units tall. So 2 I'll go in, in terms of height. And height is not what we're looking at here. So let's switch to the front by pressing the 2 key. And then I also have the uh, 7890 keys to switch between the shading mode. So I'll just press 8 to get to wireframe. And zoom in. And then scale this up until I'm certain that I've found kind of the ground plane. In, and then I'll just round it off. I can see that it should be at 1. This is going to be the domain. The, the collider for, you know, we need to set an object so that the uh, so that the liquid can collide with that object and not escape the scene. So I'll call this domain collider just so you you recognize it. And as soon as I connect it to everything, it's going to get a set of new attributes because RealFlow detects that this is now in relationship with the diverse domain. So now we have particle interaction. And we'll get to these settings in a little bit. Um, the next thing we need to do is to set up a volume that defines where the water is going to go. So I'm going to duplicate the domain collider. And I will say water... And there we have it. And then I can use this to move and scale, figure out where my water is going to go. And I want it to be, you know, I want it to be the entire area as seen from the top. And uh, I want it to be about as high as, I don't know, her knees maybe? Just, I mean, it wouldn't be really realistic. No one would be able to move effortlessly in there, but it will probably create a more interesting result if she sloshes, sloshes around in there. <laughs> so to speak. And I can actually leave it hanging out because we're going to set it up. Uh, I don't need to match it perfectly. We're going to set it up so that any uh, liquid outside of this cube is going to be clipped out. And we're going to look at that right now. Uh, what we need to do is go to Diverso and we need to create a fill object. So instead of creating a circle emitter which just spews out particles in the shape of a circle or in the shape of a square 
or in the shape of a of a narrow band or a triangle, we want to fill an object. Sounds pretty self-explanatory, right? So if I actually select that water emission and then clicks the fill object, you see that it's already pre-selected here in the object attribute. Otherwise, I would have been forced to click here and assign it after the fact. So you'll see my emitter. Actually, now this is a time where kind of the auto connect thing isn't really doing its job anymore. I want the emitter to be connected to the domain, but it isn't. And that's uh, it's a little irritating. And also the water emission is connected to the domain. But think about it, I don't want water to collide with this. I only want it there to actually define where emission is going to go. So it's time to learn to navigate this on our own. I'm going to select the connection itself, not either of the nodes, but the connection, and delete that. And honestly, I don't need the hub in this case. What I'm doing, I'm going to delete it now, and I'm actually going to take off the training wheels and say, uncheck this, add to default hub. So we're going to set up uh, we're going to define these rules now for ourselves. So the center point of this is, of course, the domain. Everything relates to the domain. The joints and surface of the character uh, is going to collide with the domain. So I just hold Control and left middle mouse drag to set up interaction with that. And the domain collider, always the, obviously, is going to co collide as well. The emitter is going to emit into it. And the water emission doesn't need to be anywhere because it's already related to the emitter by association of the attribute here. And it says in here, fill volume, yes, remove layers, zero, and jittering, some pretty specific options that we could look at later if we need to. And how about that? So if I, let's actually show you this. I can grab my domain collider we know pretty much where it is already, and my water emission, and hide them. And then I'm going to go to the beginning, reset, and hit sim. You saw already on the first frame that I actually got uh, a frame, uh, or a filled volume. It's pretty coarse still, so, but you can see particles getting kicked up already if you look closely. It's really sparse so far. Um, but you can see them kicked up. Obviously, they're just going to continue traveling pretty unnaturally, and that's because we don't have gravity. So I'm just going to click down here, hit tab, type grav, AT, and then control left middle mouse, drag that thing on top there. And now when I reset and simulate, of course, my entire water it's going to fall down because I'm not colliding with the domain. So when I set up collision with the domain and reset, all of a sudden, I only have... Why do I have water underneath the domain? We remember that I let it hang out, uh, hang out below. But why don't I have it inside of the domain collider? I can actually have... You, you know, I, I want to have the scene... Uh, shaded so I can see the character but in this case I can actually set individual display types on the uh, on the nodes themselves by clicking these tiny tiny swatches here so you just set the bounding box to those geometries that I'm talking about so why am I not getting water inside of the collider well if you look closely at the particle interaction you'll see uh, or actually above because what happens, that's the reason we need a domain here. Uh, what happens when it starts to simulate is it takes the object and it converts, it converts it to a volume, or voxels, that is. And the volume mode for this, the way that it interprets this volume, is that the volume is solid on the inside. And that's completely the opposite to what we want. We want it to be solid on the outside. So anything outside of the domain is going to be interpreted as a completely solid, meaning no particle can live there. And if we start simulating now, kind of a glitch, I'll reset. If we start simulating now, you'll see that there's water on the inside, it's falling down, it's colliding with the floor and the walls, and it's simulating. So I'll hide those again. 
Another thing I'll hide is uh, we can hide the grid by pressing the G key. We can hide, uh, honestly, the domain icon there is annoying me a bit. So I'll go down to in the domain settings to visible. Yes, obviously we want to see the particles, but I don't want to see the icon. So I can turn that off. And we want to turn up the precision here. So resolution one. Well, let's go 10 maybe and reset. You can initially uh, instantly see how many particles you're gonna get. Oh, this looks better, but uh, I don't really know what sim times I'm gonna get, but let's just try to go for maybe 50. And yeah, I think I think a little slow maybe, but uh, but we can work with this. Just for the sake of preview, let's go with 25 for now. And that's going to work a lot faster for us. One issue you'll see is that when the sim starts, the liquid needs a few frames to fall down and, and kind of land on top of itself and, and find its place because it's not compressed initially. It's just like emitted into air and then gravity acts on it. Obviously, we want it to be, you know, pretty much in this state from the very beginning without having the, the dancer act on it because that would obviously uh, punch holes in the liquid. And the way we're going to do that is use the countdown feature. So we want to simulate a few frames uh, so that the particles can reach uh, a relaxed uh, state before the character starts to move. And that's the next thing we want to set up here. So, if you press the little padlock down here, or rather, I want to start by clicking the drop down. And I want to say frames countdown. And I get this little pop up dialog, and I'm able to say, let's say that we want to sim 25 frames before the sim actually starts. So, I'll click use frames countdown. And then I'll actually make sure that the padlock is locked by clicking it. And that means that when I reset, I think I'll actually, I, I changed my mind. Let's set it back to 10 just so we can, we can, we can iterate the resolution over time instead, instead of waiting so long. So you see now that the frame is actually counting down to zero and now the sim starts and the um, character starts moving. And if you don't think that was long enough, then you can go back into the frames count and set 50 instead, maybe. And then reset it and lock it. So you can see it kind of undulating slightly there, kind of springing a bit. Hopefully enough by the time the dancer starts to move. I actually went ahead and let the uh, frames uh, cash out just so we can kind of see what we have. And honestly, you know, we don't have much, uh, if I'm being honest. And that could, that could be a few things. Uh, first of all, obviously we want to take a look at, well, first of all, obviously, uh, when I did that, I forgot to check the padlock, so I didn't actually get the run-up or the pre-roll, but let's ignore that for now. I'll do it. I'll make sure to do it next time. Um, but let's focus on kind of the interaction with the character. And there's a few things I want to mention here. First of all, um, if I go to uh, the resolution here, I set it to 10, but the density is still a thousand, which means for every particle, the density density has now gotten roughly 10 times lower. That might sound a little uh, sketchy, but honestly, it, it's true. I mean, you don't have to, every time you raise the resolution, raise the density, but sooner or later, you're gonna end up far from the initial resolution and far from the in initial density per particle. And you're gonna get uh, a liquid that reacts 
too much to, in this case, gravity, which is my only demon in the scene. Uh, so basically, uh, it really makes the motion die down a lot faster. So what I want to do, b without any further ado, is I want to multiply this by 10 and um, see him again pretty soon. What I'm going to do, another thing, I mean, obviously we 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 still don't have a lot of resolution, but we also want to make sure that we just debug uh, the collision surface. So I'm going to select the collision surface and I'm going to go down to uh, display, display volume and ISO surface. And that allows me to take a look at what the solver is really making out of the mesh. And because, like I said before, uh, it has to convert the mesh into a volume or voxels before it can actually simulate. And in this case, I'm just gonna ramp up in slow numbers here so we arrive at something that... You see, I'm just using uh, under the volume here. Uh, this is gonna be real, even if I turn off this uh, this display ISO surface, it's just a visualization of the, um, of the collision area. But it's actually what's gonna collide. So I can drive, I can derive two things from this. Uh, first of all, we should probably offset it a bit uh, to get closer. Um, but also, I think I need to go down in cell size uh, to get a, a more granular level here. You see when I cut it in half, all of a sudden it follows the shape of the character closer. So I'm going to go point up uh, two, five, yeah, I'm pretty close now. And then I'll dial that offset uh, back quite a bit because it's, it's not really necessary anymore now that we've um, now that we've uh, raised the position. I can still, you know, keep it slightly outside of the original mesh if I wanted to make a bigger impact. There's another thing I can do. Uh, I can go to uh, the particle settings and enable vorticity boost. And aside from that fact, here's probably the best advice I can give you about real flow. Say you have a parameter in front of you that you might want to tweak, but you don't really know what it's doing. So what you would do in any other type of situation is you got to go to the help. You got to figure out, okay, what am I doing here? I'm looking at the property in the DUI domain, and you got to figure out where the DUI domain. Honestly, I've never even been in here. I don't even know how to find. So it's in DUI domain. And then if I find that, then I, you know, I didn't even find it. But if I find it, I have to uh, to filter out and, and search for the very property vorticity boost. But I'm not going to do that. In RealFlow, it's so easy to just highlight the property you want to work with and press the F1 key. And it gives you an extract from the documentation, but for that very... I mean, this has saved me... I mean, how many times have I used RealFlow? Thousands? How many times have I used this feature? It has saved me days, weeks, and months, honestly, of my life uh, of not going through the help. So select the property, press F1. So vorticity boost gives a more turbulent and water-like fluid. Increase this factor, but try to avoid very high values because uh, it completely distorts the fluid. So we don't want to go overboard here, but something like one, for starters, could be good. And let's look at damping as well. Damping smoothens the rel relative velocities b between nearby particles. A small amount of damping helps to stabilize the simulation. But it seems like our sim is very stable, and we might not want that. So um, let's just dial it down a bit. Um, and as I'm going now, I'm kind of breaking a rule. Uh, but early on, I try. I I tend to maybe dial in a few parameters and then see where it takes me but typically otherwise you want to tweak one thing at a time and test it so that you can be confident in you know what am i doing here uh, what effect did this have on the sim and so what we did is we adjusted the uh, collision for the character we also up to the vorticity boost, we up to the density. And I think that's that's enough for now. Uh, we're just gonna have to sim and see where this takes us. So, first of all, 
let's want to turn that off, that ISO surface off, because I don't want to be calculating that as I'm simming. That's just unnecessary computation. Also, before we go, we should probably just make sure that the joints, because they're going to be colliding as well. So uh, we could be just we could be just syncing those two settings. The beta surface was 0.025. So let's set that. And let's see. Do we need do we need some offset here as well? We do not need 0.1. We might need. Let's cut that by 10. Yeah, so this I'm more happy with. So I'll go down and turn off that ISO surface. And this time I'm going to make sure the sim with delay or roll up and reset and sim. So the sim has been running along a couple hundred frames. So let's just look at it slightly. Uh, we see now that the, the run up is there. Um, frame zero was incorrect, but frame one is good. And we can see a few things like, first of all, it's kicking up water a lot more like we expected it to. And that's really nice. That's exactly what we wanted to achieve. And it's doing that for one or two reasons. So maybe I was going over the top with the density. Maybe I should have, you know, gone up slightly, but not as much. Uh, but I'm not going to be bothered by that right now because I know that we will be going up so much in resolution. So that effect might be mitigated by that anyway. Um, but really, if you think of it, it's it's easy to think like, oh my God, it's never settling down. But imagine if you were in this small of a pool and you were doing capoeira in the middle of it. The water would never, you know, settle really. So... Um, we just want to avoid kind of a springy look that looks like an artifact. But uh, when it comes to anything else, uh, it will be fine, I think. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's a combination of, honestly, I don't think it's density that much that uh, makes it kick up. I think it's mainly uh, the, the adjustment to the collision shape and maybe the vorticity boost a bit. Um, but uh, let's talk a bit about display of particles. So obviously, if you take a look, you can see that some of the particles are brighter. And what, why is that? It's because they are uh, in higher velocity, because that's the only thing we're looking at. If we go to the part in the shot here, uh, if we go to the um, dy domain, and we go down to display, you can see that the property I'm using to visualize my particles is velocity. And what does that mean? Well, it means that it's using the velocity information per particle to shade it from this dark blue, which are the, the static particles, up into the bright values. And that means, if you want to use that, it means you have to set the range. And the default is 0.05 to 5, a velocity of 0.05 to 5. Um, there is actually a pretty cool tool that you can use called Particle Tooltip, which allows you to look at a particle and see the velocity. If you take a look at it, I can't change my mouse here because then it disappears, but if you look at the third row from the top, uh, you see it says velocity in X, Y, and Z. So uh, the combined, the magnitude of that velocity would be pretty low, somewhere around 0.05. Uh, and then we can hover over one of the faster particles in the scene. We see that the velocity is, um, the magnitude of this would be probably around 4. Uh, I don't really recall the formula for magnitude, but I mean, yeah, it seems, it seems like that's a good range, but you can also have automatic range. Um, and you can also like purposely clamp this if you want to. So apparently when I set it to automatic range, it probably did a quick analysis of the scene and found like the fastest particle currently, uh, which is uh, around six. Uh, so that, that sounds better, but you can always kind of like uncheck this and uh, mimic that value or just kind of like clamp it to exaggerate the effect. Maybe you're, you don't think you're seeing too much. So if you're actually lowering 
the, the value for the max range, you actually see more. But I think, to be honest, that in order to, to get a good idea of this, we have to get more particles. Um, so I want to show you a few things after resimming in a high resolution. And one of them is um, obviously what that looks like, and the other is using another property called vorticity. Uh, vorticity, if you take a look down here, what happened when I switched? Warning the particle channel vorticity has not been computed. Go to particle channels and activate the option to compute this channel. And we're going to do that. We're going to go to vorticity, yes. And the reason I want to do that is because it, uh, it gives you a little, um, in this case especially, you know, if, if it was just, um, uh, you know, a splash in a glass or something like that, velocity would be fine. But if, um, if we were, uh, when you have a particle moving through, uh, when you have, sorry, not a particle, when you have a character moving through a fluid like that, the vel this velocity kind of dies out pretty fast. But afterwards there's going to be like swirls in the area and that's what vorticity can can show us uh, so obviously we want to compute vorticity uh, so we're going to do that and we're going to go to 50 in resolution and if we don't get rid of the bounciness anytime soon we're probably going to have to lower density again but let's see if if things just uh, looks better uh, with um, with a higher resolution So one thing I realized I've actually forgot, because you could probably see the first few frames like I was simming, you could actually see uh, values uh, that the vorticity display was working. But after the sim was done, if I update my timeline cache here, even if I did check that compute vorticity checkbox, which uh, the help asked me to do, there still was no information. And why is that? Well, this is, to be honest, a little silly. Um, you actually have to make sure that the particles are uh, exporting that very uh, channel into the file, actually writing it to disk. So I'm going to go to export particle cache RPC and I'm going to check options and then I'm going to scroll down and make sure that the vorticity is actually going to be written as well, not just calculated by r but written. So why would it? Why would they have it like that? Well, in case you may, you know, like you're calculating it, you're using it for something like a, uh, let's say in another case we would be uh, simulating foam or something like that. So the vorticity would be used for outputting the foam, but then not saved, just to save disk space or something like that. But in this case, I want the vorticity because I'm going to use it as a debug. Now, mind you, uh, as you probably figured out, since we're actually checking this to be exported, this will use extra space, but in this case, I think it's worth it. Another thing I want to show you, um, if we switch back, sadly, we can't look at vorticity yet, so uh, we need to resim. If we switch back to velocity, you can see that um, we're already seeing some interesting uh, new motion here with, with higher, uh, higher detail, but um, I want to be clamping this down a bit, so it seems like the max is around 3 go around 1.5 so you can see that there's some interesting motion going on now but one thing I wanted to because uh, I can see already that I'm gonna want more resolution even and now comes the time like uh, you'll see if I go up here uh, it, it took me to get to frame 150 it took me eight minutes um, of sim time it's not it's not a big deal, honestly, but anytime I'm starting to go up in particle count, I'm having to wait a few seconds per uh, per frame. Honestly, the user interface is going to be drawing all of these points, and it might seem like a trivial ordeal, you know, like sim drawing a point. Like it's only like one point in one color. It's not shaded or anything like that. There's no fancy reflections or anything. But honestly, this can take a toll on your sim time. So I don't want to be drawing the particles as I'm simming. And another thing, I may accidentally set, you know, like a crazy attribute somewhere or for any other reason the sim might crash and then I don't want my real flow to crash. So you might be guessing what I'm getting at. I want to be simulating in the background. 
So I'm going to show you how to do that now. Honestly, it's really simple. You just go and in the simulate drop down, click the arrow, click and hold, and command line. You want to check that. We could also, before we go, we can say command line options. And you, in this case, I can make sure that it's the range of the sim is the same as the scene, the threads are the same as the scene, the arguments are none because you can kind of make sure that uh, the, the same is reset before it begins, you can make sure that cache is used, you can make sure that it's uh, it's gonna force to mesh, any mesh node in the scene, even if it's not enabled, uh, we'll get back to that later. Um, and also you can use a node license if you have one of those, so I have a node license and I can click this in order to still keep working in the GUI. But for now, I'm just gonna hit OK. I don't need to make any changes to that. And I want to update my um, resolution to 100. And then I'm just going to hit simulate. See, I didn't reset or anything like that. I only hit sim. And even still, it jumped back to uh, frame 1. And then I could start and overwrite. What it didn't do, though, because I didn't check my padlock is do the roll up notice what happened there I didn't stop the sim I just closed the command line and that's it really uh, closing the command line that's that stops the sim so now we have it running lock mode 50 frames to go and honestly this is all the information I need I can see here what is in the scene uh, so it says this is kind of where it starts. This is from the frame before. It's constant, constantly going to update as it progresses through the sim. Uh, so it's on frame minus 46. Summary information. These are the objects in my scene. I can see the poly counts. I can see the uh, particle count as it is right now. I can see a list of the daemons. So this can get pretty long if you have a big scene. Uh, I can also see how far, how much time have, have we used so far how much time is expected to be used for the entire range, like all the way to 500 in this case, and what's the average time per frame. So this is, honestly, this is all I need uh, in, order to, uh, in order to just monitor the sim right now. And the beauty of this is, uh, like I said, it's more efficient. In some cases, you could get, you could get, uh, I mean, I... <laughs> I'm looking for the right word here. I can. Um, I don't want to exaggerate, but you can easily double or... Uh, I mean, I've had cases where, especially with the old standard particles, it's gone up to like six times faster going um, command line sim because it does uh, uh, use the resources a lot more efficiently. But, you know, uh, one, one classic use case is I will start a sim here and I will let it go like 50 frames and then I can load that cache right here in the GUI and look at it while the, while the sim is going on in the background and I can start setting up my mesh while it's continuing to simulate in the background. And when I'm done setting up my mesh, I can start, you know, another instance which is meshing parallel to, uh, to the particle sim. That's just one example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this uh, simmer for a bit and then when it's computed a couple of real frames, so to speak, uh, we're going to take a look at those in the in the GUI. So my sim has now completed like 20 frames or so. Um, so one difference when you're simulating in the background and you want to actually see what you've done. I mean, obviously, when you sim in the GUI, you see the frames that have progressed. But in the case of uh, simming in the background, you have to upload it, upload. Uh, update the timeline cache, I mean, in order to, to kind of see how far you've gotten. Um, and in this case, you know, I've gone to the entire uh, range previously, so I actually have data already, and it's writing, overriding it as it goes. So I'm going to have to, like, keep an eye on this. If I wanted, you know, this to be representative of how far this actual sim had gotten, I would have had to go into the tools and um, clean the data folder before. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's not really that big of a need to do that, but you can if you want to. Um, 
I'm gonna just uh, keep this uh, on the side here uh, so I can just see how far it's gotten. I'm gonna go to frame 30, uh, let's say 32 right now. And here we can see some pretty nice detail, to be honest. Uh, and let's see if we can figure out the diff if we can spot the difference between uh, vorticity and velocity now. So we have velocity, and if we switch to vorticity, uh, obviously this range is way incorrect, so we need to crank that down. Uh, starting with automatic, we can see uh, between zero and 150. Uh, so probably need to like take pick up the lower end probably. Uh, a bit so we don't get those crazy particles on the sides and this is interesting like um i'm just setting it can i set something like that point between point 0.1 and 50 maybe um so i'm kind of just clamping it to to show more detail and there actually is in the automatic range so we switch between velocity and vorticity. So the detail in vorticity you will see kind of lingers there longer. You see that they're not really uh, displaced that much anymore but the kind of vorticity energy is still there if you will. So this can really help you uh, to figure out what's going on, figure out the kind of detail that you're going to get. And later on I'm going to show you how we can actually export this information all the way to the mesh. So you can actually render with this. So it's not, it's not just an exercise for debugging uh, what it looks like. But we need to take a look at the performance uh, as a whole. So actually I'm just going to click play here and let it, I mean it's obviously not going to be real time because this is a, uh, it's pretty heavy, it's up to like 50 megs per frame so we can't expect it to be real time. And we can note two things now. The particle count is so much higher up. Uh, I actually ran out of the particles there because I actually wiped that folder um, b before I started. But you can see it's not it's not springing around so much anymore because we've gone up so much in particle count that we we needed a high resolution anyway. Um, so we're not we're not uh, in that bad shape when it comes to like the jerkiness of the sim. I'm gonna go from the first few. Also seems like I'm looking at the edges to make sure that it initially isn't bouncing around because that would have been an indication that we would have needed a longer uh, run-up. But I'm starting to, you know, I'm starting to feel like this might be something to show. Honestly, um, I want more. I want more detail and things like that. So, like, one thing we could do is make a s just a subtle adjustment to the way that the mesh interacts with the particles and we're going to give it more friction so it's going to drag more particles along um, and let's just up this by a factor of 10 actually let's go 0.025 so it's like 250 percent higher friction maybe we'll see something there i actually might want to if we go to the front view pressing 2 on the keyboard uh, i mean we did want it to be higher, but uh, what we didn't take into consideration then is that like we need to compress before it can sim. So let's bring it a little higher even still. Uh, our, now I actually have the character selected and it's not letting me move her, which I appreciate because uh, that would mess things up. So I'm just going to go almost up to her waist, but take into consideration that that's before the run-up. So we've seen now how to visualize the particle movement with vorticity and I've gotten a few f more frames in the background while I've been talking so uh, let me let me look at those as well. Yeah it's starting to look a little more interesting. Two more things before we sim again. Um, we only have gravity at the moment and honestly I always have a drag demon. Drag force can be thought of as, you know, a way to just 
you know, make sure that the energy that the particles have uh, doesn't isn't conserved as long. It just helps kind of simulate that effect of you know air resistance uh, drag. Uh, really, <laughs> is what it is. Uh, it's you know you can think of this. Uh, one of one of the instructors I learned real flow real flow from used to say that you can think of it as a recipe, and that's exactly what it is. You know, it's. It's, it's it, this is one of these things I just do it by habit I always add a drag force demon and I'm gonna hide it as well I can you can press control H uh, instead of finding the little uh, swatch there so now we have drag force added and connected and also as always keep upping that resolution uh, we're starting to get pretty high um, and I think unless the result of this run is terrible, then we might want to start at meshing. So we are about 50 frames into the sim, and it took me 35 minutes to get there, and it's doing roughly one frame in 20 seconds, and it's going to take about 2 hours 35 minutes additionally to finish the entire sequence. I wouldn't say this is terrible sim times, we are after all dealing with 2.2 uh, million particles, uh, calculated uh, on a frame-by-frame -frame basis or even several times per frames because there are sub-steps as well. Um, yeah, so you know. Uh, I mean, let's be honest, this example maybe not the ideal like first project, but for me it was just at, off the top of my head the easiest way to just show you the whole flow from beginning to end. But, uh, I mean, it's always going to be yourself who's going to be the deciding factor and like what kind of machine do you have how many particles can you actually handle and how much particles does the result um, require you know how, how many particles does it take to make this look nice as a mesh which uh, hint hint is what we're going to look at next but i wanted to say one thing first um and obviously like the higher you go in res, the more particles you're going to have. But also you're going to notice that it's not linearly increasing. We were at 100 before, and we had about 700,000 700, particles. And now we have 2.2. So it's definitely an exponential uh, thing. Uh, so it's hard to, uh, to know beforehand how many particles you're going to end up with. Another thing to, t to take note of, if I play this back now, you're going to see that now we're starting to be, you know, not really interactive anymore, so to speak. So we might want to do something like uh, creating a preview of the frames that we have seen so far, instead of watching it in the interface. And the way you do that is you find yourself the kind of view that you want to see it in. I'm going to turn off my grid by pressing G on the keyboard. And you can also go to the view, show, and disable it up here. And uh, I'm just going to go ahead and press playback and open GL preview. When you do that, it's going to start churning through frame by frame, just playing it back and saving this preview of the current frame to memory. And I'm going to let it run for how, whatever many frames I have seen so far, 60. So since uh, previous simulations are going to take over after the currently simulating frame, it's going to be a glitch. I want to go ahead and just escape out of this before I get there. And that means it's going to stop uh, generating. And then it's going to load up in this little player window here, right inside of RealFlow. To be honest, I'm not a big fan of this player because it really struggles even with like a low res JPEG uh, output that uh, real, real flow is outputting, it struggles playing real time. So I typically just want to go uh, to my data folder by going to File, Open Project Folder. Then I'll go to Preview, Video, and inside of here is a Frames folder that is going to have all of the current frames saved out as, uh, fr as images. And uh, then you can just load these into whatever frame wrangler you have. Uh, if you have uh, DJV View or PD Player, or I use uh, RV for these cases, um, or if you 
just want to load them up into After Effects or whatever. So, oops, I didn't have it preset to, obviously you're not looking at PNGs. So, now we can see it in real time. It's just a couple of seconds, obviously. But I can see that, you know, there's some nice detail in here. I can't wait to see those little ripples that are left uh, after the motion dissipates uh, in the render. Now that I'm seeing it in real time, you see there's a bit of a bump. Uh, so obviously I think we want to add at least like 25 or 50 more frames to the pre-roll, which is going to up the same time uh, significantly, but it's going to be worth it in an end. But uh, with this result, I think I think we're good to um, to start uh, meshing. All right, the sim is almost done. It's got about half an hour to go, but I'd like to pick up here and uh, start looking at the mesh. This is obviously going to be meshed into a water surface. That's going to be rendered with a refractive shader. Um, so, one reason to get into meshing as early as possible, pretty much. Sometimes, uh, if you are confident with the setup that you've made, uh, sometimes I'll even throw in a mesh uh, in some of the first iterations of the sim with just auto settings, just to see a surface rather than looking at particles. And why is that? Well, if you take a look in my particle director here, you'll see that I'm currently at a uh, file size of 150 megs per frame. Um, I mean, it's still manageable, it just takes a couple of seconds per frame. And as we saw before, we can play back with the uh, OpenGL preview. But honestly, it's getting a little sluggish, and I've uh, had cases where, you know, you have um, three, five hundred megs per frame, and that's no fun. And uh, that takes a lot, a lot of storage, which which means that if you're not made of money, you're not going to have it on a fast storage. And if you're in a professional environment, you're going to have it on a network storage. And I'll tell you, it's no fun to cache. Uh, like even even if you're doing the the playback, the OpenGL preview, uh, I remember I had a shot that was easily I think it was two terabytes uh, of sims that shot, some 200 million particles, uh, and I mean just to do uh, an OpenGL preview would take you know two hours, and you can't do the preview on the network either. So uh, it's going to be a lot faster to play back a poly mesh. Uh, because a poly mesh with, um, for some reason, I mean, uh, I, I, I see a particle count of 2.2 million. I would assume we're going to end up with a mesh to get the finer details. Uh, at least a million, million and a half uh, polygons. But that's still going to be a lot faster to draw. Um, because, uh, yeah, in OpenGL. So, uh, and the other reason is, obviously... A mesh is the final product in this case. We're not going to be rendering. Sometimes you do. You do render individual particles. But in this case, uh, what we are going to be rendering is uh, a, po a polygon mesh uh, with a refractive shader. So it's time to start looking at that. And uh, the procedure can be a little different depending on uh, where you're coming from. Diverso, hybrido, standard particles. If you're using... Uh, uh, diverse so or standard, you can use Particle Mesh VDB, Particle Mesh, or Particle Mesh Legacy. Uh, if I can, I want to use VDB. It's the newest. Uh, uh, if you're familiar with VDB from elsewhere, you probably got the gist already. But it's a it, it's a volume based uh, measure that is a lot more efficient than the other ones. There are probably cases where those might come in handy, but this is what you want to go with: Particle Mesh VDB. And uh, what you'll see instantly when I add it is the diverso dim domain gets added underneath it, and that means it's associated basically. Um, so, where is the mesh? Obviously, uh, it's not here. And if we want to see the mesh, well, all we need to do is 
for the current frame that I'm at right now, I can right click and say build. And it's going to say meshing. And the mesh is done. We're going to see it in here. That's how you create a mesh. And now we can see the mesh. Um, I'm going to smooth shade the mesh and I'm going to go to um, show and at the bottom I want to turn off the selection highlighting because even though I have the mesh selected which I'm going to want to have I want to have the mesh selected because I want to have access to the properties here but I don't want to see the the polygrid um, uh, highlighted I want to see the result but this is obviously you know if, if we go to, to uh, wireframe we can see that we're pretty far off so there's a lot to do here and uh, I don't want to spend all day on this because uh, this is supposed to be short and sweet. So let's try to get through this pretty fast, honestly. Uh, the first thing, obviously, that we need to do is we need to opt the poly count. Um, and uh, the default is 0 0.5. I could try 0 0.2. Uh, and I can build again. This, however, tweaking a value, because we're going to be tweaking a lot of values. And right-click and say build that gets uh, old pretty fast. So instead, we're going to use the possibility to mesh interactively. And when you enable mesh interactively, as soon as you make a setting, it's going to update the mesh for you as fast as it can. But since we have a meshing time of, uh, at this case, uh, nine seconds, that's pretty fast, but that's just because we are still so low in poly count. But anyway, we want to be working as fast as we can, so I'm going to under the particle mesh, under the node settings at, per, at the weight up top, I want to enable bounded. And when you enable bounded, you get a bounding box. Surprise, surprise. And I'm just going to select that bounding box and transform it as if it was a cube. And you already see what the bounded mode is for. It allows us to focus on this specific area in this case. So I'm just going to dial in a region that I like to work with. And now we can start getting more specific and trying to get closer to the particles. And when I say closer to the particles, I want the mesh result to resemble more of the result that we have from the particle simulation. And we can see, like if we look at the outline, we can see that this little crest here is not representative near uh, in the... It's nowhere near where I want to be. And why is that? We have already started to introduce a lot of detail with particles, and we can keep doing so. But it's never going to be enough. And that's because we need to also visit the settings on the underlying diverse domain. And here we have a particle radius. And if we just, for starters, as I like to do, as you've seen before, I like to cut the value in half, first of all, and just see what, where that brings us. You see that we're already starting to bring back a lot of that detail. And uh, you want to be a bit gentle with this. You want to go slow and get closer to the profile of the sim with your mesh. Because if you go too low, uh, then the, like, if you imagine two neighboring particles and you go too low then it's no longer going to be like a they're no lo no longer going to be smeared bridged together uh, it's going to be uh, holes in between them and that's going to be throughout the entire mesh so a mesh of like a million polygons could easily turn into 20 million polygons and then you know it takes a while to to mesh that uh, I'm just slowly but steady going down 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 until I think I'm getting closer I don't need to be getting, you know, too perfect at this stage. I just want something to look at. And uh, I'm going to go to perspective here, pressing the 4 key. I'm just taking a look. Like, I want, I, w I want, like, the individual droplets to, to make sense. I mean, I never expected them to be as small as a particle. So it's important that now that we dial in the size that we want a droplet to have. And there's also uh, later on some fine tuning that we can do for for things that are uh, a part of you know splashy regions of the mesh, so we don't have to to find like a, the 
the golden number here. Uh, but I do want to take it a slight step down still. Uh, without, like, the mesh being chewed up too much. I think these irregularities are starting to... I want to maintain the droplet look. And go back to the mesh. Introduce more polys by lowering the polygon size. Uh, so we're, yeah, better. Point double oh eight, and obviously at some point you want to um, turn off interactively turn off bounded right click and just build the entire mesh reason i'm doing that is like in case i have arrived at a setting that inadvertently is going to render me at 200 polygons i don't want to still be in mesh interactive and crash the entire scene uh, so i'd like to be a bit selective there another thing that we can do uh, obviously there's since we have pretty small polys right but there's a lot of polygons underneath here, and we're never going to be rendering that. So we can actually, let's take the water emission uh, geometry that we created. And I'm just going to call it mesh clip. And this one I'm going to use just to cut off the bottom. But still be careful, because you don't want to be... You don't want to be cutting too high because she is going to create, you know, uh, indents in the liquid uh, once she's moving around. And we don't want those to be bottomless cut off. So I'm going to put this pretty low. And just get it out a bit. So we take a look at perspective. We want pretty much the measure to cut out anything that is within this box. Let me go to wireframe and take a look at the feet here. So hide the mesh, hide the domain. Yeah, probably. Yeah, let's go. Let's go with that for now. So anything that goes inside of this box is going to be cut from the meshing. And the way you set that up is you just go to the mesh and go down to clipping and press this hamburger icon here and I select my mesh clip geometry and that's it really so the next time I mesh take a take a note here 1.4 million polys same settings and now just removing those polygons that we were never going to be uh, rendering anyway we didn't want to see them uh, instead we're going to arrive at 780 so I mean that's close to half that we wasted before which means that we can afford more up here so I'm going to hide the mesh clip and uh, let's see I'm probably not going to bring this to you know like <laughs> feature quality if anyone expected that um, but could be nice to just get some more, some more. Mm -hmm. We can grab the bounding cube and pull it out a bit and take a look at some other areas. I do like to look at the trail behind her though. Like what's going on here? Can we see that detail? Yes, we can. That's nice. Um, so, I mean, it, it's starting to come close. And, and normally, I, w I would stress, you know, not overdoing this, uh, but rather trying to get to a state where you're good to do a render test as soon as possible. Um, but the one thing I want to address before I do that is getting rid of some of the uniformity. Because we have some decent size 
uh, blobbies. Uh, and I get that. Looking at it, it in a frozen state like this, I many times, many, many, many times, I think, oh, it's too blobby. But then, I mean, always look at references of this stuff, you know. Uh, it's usually a lot blobbier than you would expect in real life. But regardless, uh, we don't want to be this uniform. So for the sake of combating that look, we're going to be using the filters down here. As far as filters are concerned, uh, the setup can be a little different between uh, diverso particles, hybrido particles, and standard particles. Um, Hybrido and diverse particles have access to volume filter and standard only have mesh filter. But you can also go in and um, set a filter on the associated domain. In this case, uh, there's a filter. Uh, well, probably before we get to that, I should show you what filters do. I'm going to keep mesh interactive turned on. And I still, I'm still in bounded mode. And let's, for example, add a smooth filter. You should see, see straight away what it does. Uh, I can do it twice, for example. Uh, I'm just going to do an overall smoothing, if you will. I tend to have a bit of smoothing, but I uh, don't want to go overboard, so I'm going to leave it at 1. Then, if you want to, you can erode as well. And this is going to eat into the mesh to bring it you know, closer to the result of the particles, if you want to. Uh, in this case, I'm not going to do that because I think it uh, gives a forced impression. And uh, sometimes when, when these shapes and the splashes get really like sharp, pointy, or kind of blady, um, that's a typical look that you often see from real flow sims that I like to try to stay away from, honestly. Instead, I think I'm going to leave it to just a smooth, as far as volume filters are concerned. And then mesh filters, I want to, let's see, thinning, uh, mesh overall quality. Mm. I think we can use it, but we, I'm just going to cut it in half. I do like relaxation, however. Uh, and that kind of works on the edges, uh, and especially like in the in the areas where you have action going on. So if we set an exaggerated value to one or two, you can kind of see what it's doing. I just want okay. Don't go overboard here. Let's like take a look at the blobbies here. See, it's kind of eating into like in a road wood but in a nicer way I don't want to go this high though I want to keep it pretty low but instead uh, turn up the steps so maybe I'll do eight steps and if you turn on off and on you can see what it does overall and this I like I like to be able to to enforce this kind of smooth tints out but also um, also kind of dilating them in a nicer way than using the erode uh, or <laughs> eroding them I mean shrinking the mesh there's also going to be by default a velocity filter applied um, which is gonna let's see all speed values will be clipped to the given value Okay, let's see, like a value of 20. You know, typically I don't use this one, but I guess if you dial in the right values, you can get it to kind of shrink the faster they go. Honestly, motion blur will take care, take care of that altogether, so I rarely go in and fine tune these things. What you can do though is take a look at core and splash filters and um, I'm not going to be able to do that now because you have to uh, calculate that channel you have to go to um, the particle export and enable the neighbor channel but if you do that uh, then the mesh filter is going to be able to check the particle if it's in an area where there's splash going on or in an area where there's 
pretty much core core fluid or uh, calm water and then you can act the filter on those particles alone and that could be helpful if you're like if you have a need to kind of smooth out the, the comma areas and not the splash areas what I'm going to do though is I'm going to turn off interactive and turn off bounded and take a look at the build mesh for the entire thing now that we have filters applied and see if this is something that we can be happy enough with and move on to a test render so I right clicked and picked build I'm kind of kind of liking it I think we're ready to um, build the mesh for the entire sequence and this we haven't done so far so what do we need to do um, first of all we've only been building the mesh frame by frame but now we want to do a sequence well there are a few ways to do that uh, either you can just go to the beginning if you pick this one in the mesh shelf build mesh sequence then the selected mesh is going to build or probably all meshes sorry uh, are going to build from frame to frame so it's just mimicking the behavior that we've been doing right clicking and picking build and then stepping to the next frame and right click and build that's essentially what it's going to do for us but I don't want to do that I want to I want to launch this in the background and in order to do that uh, I just need to simulate because you remember it's set to build so if it is set to build then when we simulate or, uh, or press action then it's going to get built on a per frame basis one very important thing to do though before we do that is remember what's going to happen if we press simulate obviously we're going to simulate the liquid but we don't need to do that. We're happy with our liquid. So we need to set the liquid to cache mode. And now that we set it to cache mode, it's not going to be simulated, but the particle mesh is going to be able to take the particles as an input and base the mesh off of that. And I mean, the time difference between meshing frame by frame and calculating the sim and meshing frame by frame is huge, obviously. And this is something we use, you know, like maybe I would have Sometimes I will I will um, build the um, uh, I will sim the particles and create a preview mesh in one go and then in the second go I'm happy with the particles but I'm just going to re refine the mesh and then I'll enable so in the first run they're both active and then in the second run the sim is cached and the mesh is uh, active so having done that uh, I'm not going to use countdown anymore because we don't need to count down we're, we're just basing this off of uh, the frames make sure we go into command line options and uh, don't need to do anything there so I'm just going to hit simulate I'll just let it run a frame or two. And then we can just verify by stepping through here. So there we go. Now that we saw that there's been a frame built for the for the first frame. So I'm just going to turn off the visibility of the um, of the domain, and I'm going to save and uh, let the sim do its thing. Before I wrap this section up, though, I could mention that uh, aside from the fact of caching, what I could do, like the next time now that the mesh is done, I want to play back uh, only the mesh, and just for comparison's sake, let's take a look because we've been checking out the file sizes and we know that the particles clocked in at roughly 150 megs per frame but the mesh is only 50 megs per frame so it's a lot uh, easier to handle and draw for uh, for the app so what we could do is avoid entirely that the particles are being read and the way we do that is not only we can disable we can also this little floppy disk icon we can set that to red and that means it's not able to read or write the data from disk. It's very important to remember to set that back though, if we need to remesh, for example, otherwise it's gonna draw blank.
my mesh is now finished and it took about an hour 50 uh, with an average frame time of 13 seconds which is pretty decent for meshing uh, we ended up with 1.4 million faces then again um, more or less glancing over this and uh, might not be you know final final quality but uh, still gives you an idea of what kind of uh, processing times you can expect here um, yeah so like I said this will play back a lot faster we should be able to see that in the window and we can also do a preview But what I really wanted to do now that we have a mesh for the entire sequence is uh, create a render test. And uh, we're going to do that, first of all, inside of RealFlow. And then we'll take a quick look at uh, how we can... Um, basically, I want to keep as much as possible of this inside of RealFlow because I uh, don't want you to be confined to uh, my workflow uh, in Maya. Uh, so. Uh, let's first take a look at uh, the preview rendering capabilities and then I mean uh, I'll show you as a bonus how you can how you can do it in Maya and then I, I'm sure you can find your way in whatever native app you have so we have a mesh I have disabled visibility on the domain so I only have the mesh and then I want to come over to the render tab and I'm just gonna hit fire and when you do that it's going to say voxelizing and the first time it usually takes a while because it needs to take the entire mesh which is a couple of million polys and create voxels from that uh, which it needs to do in order to be able to give you a fast preview but once it's done it's pretty damn fast to be honest it's pretty uh, interactive uh, so Max will uh, used to be like one of the f one of the few renderers that was really easy to get started with, uh, so-called turnkey renderer, where you know you get you got good realism and high quality uh, right off the bat, just at the press of a button. Uh, and I was always really impressed with this fire uh, preview, uh, even if like production renders can take a bit longer time, uh, but but. Uh, you know the the quality really is uh, up there, and it's pretty sweet that they integrated this into into RealFlow because even if I'm not going to render ultimately in Maxwell, it's really cool to be able to uh, apply a shader, uh, have some pretty default like sun and sky or import an HDRI, and just fire off a render without having to go through the trouble of uh, logistics to my native 3D app and set up shaders and lighting and batch renders and whatnot. So let's take a look at uh, how, to, how to wrangle the Maxwell Interactive uh, and then uh, preview render actually. Uh, so first thing I want to do is want to take the second button from the left which is Maxwell Scene Setup uh, or Scene Parameters. Uh, and it's really dark in here and by default the Maxwell renderer uses Physical Sky and in this case, uh, it's um, I don't know really how this is picked. If it might have been at some point when I saved this, might have been the time. Uh, I don't think I was up that early. Uh, but regardless, I'm just gonna advance it to the middle of the day and press apply. And you see how fast that updates. I'm gonna stick with this for now, and um, we'll look at the other stuff in a bit. So we're just gonna get out of here now that we can see it clearly. And the default seems to be a somewhat grayish shader, uh, and I don't really want that. I want, uh, I mean, a greenish shader. And that's, if we go to the bottom, we can see it says Maxwell Render Material from Node. And Node is just a green color. So instead, from, instead of from Node, I'm going to say Water, Clear Water, let's say... Hmm, foam, it says. Let's go with deep ocean, no foam. Okay. 
I'm gonna do white paint and then I'm gonna do black paint on the joints. And that's gonna be it. Uh, I'm just gonna fire off a preview render now just to show you uh, how to set that up. So you'll go to Maxwell Scene again uh, and then you can pick between uh, engine, production or draft. In this case I want to keep the frame times down. Um, so the interesting thing with Maxwell is it's going to render you know in a standard renderer you're used to setting the quality level for each and every aspect like the quality for reflections, quality for light, quality for motion blur but in this case it just renders the best picture it can within the time it's been given. So now it's, it's two, uh, 10 minutes per frame. It's been allowed 10 minutes per frame. I want to crank that down. So I'm just going to give it one minute per frame. And that's going to be a lot, uh, you know, it's going to be a lot uh, noisier than what we're seeing here. Just, But I, I just want to get some, some, some progress pretty fast here. And then I'm going to go playback and Maxwell preview. So it's going to go to the first frame. Uh, the first frame doesn't have any mesh, so this is a little pointless. Uh, but it's going to go one of one out of two things is going to happen. Either it's going to hit that uh, shading level, the quality level that was designated, and we left that at the default, or it's going to reach the time limit of 60 seconds. And whenever it's done that, it's going to uh, advance to the next frame. And the more complex your scene is, uh, you know, uh, the left, the more noise is going to be left in there by the time it reaches 60 seconds, because denoising is what takes that long time, getting that clean image and getting rid rid of things like fireflies or or, or noise in the image. Um, and then, so that's important to know. Like if your scene is m roughly the same throughout like here um, we have the same amount of liquid it just happens to be splashing more or less uh, so the quality should not change that much but I will show you in some of the specific cases where I've used the uh, this methodology uh, where I'm kind of adding more liquid as time goes on or adding more complexity and since I have a time limit and the complexity increases, what happens is the amount of grain also increases, if you know what I mean. So you got to be a bit careful about this. Sometimes you need to set a higher threshold so that it instead reaches uh, a shading level instead of reaching a time. I'll show you how to set up then. Uh, you can just go into render instead. And that's actually going to load up um, some settings for you, a lot more settings here. And it's going to put you in uh, Maxwell Studio uh, or just a kind of like uh, dialed down version of that and it gives you a lot more bells and whistles to play with. Uh, we don't really need to go into this but this is mainly what I used um, either the preview or the render window is what I used for um, for the letter series and here you can pretty much the same settings but you get the opportunity to just confirm there. And then when you hit render, it starts working. Let's take a look, by the way, at what we got from the meshing. You'll see that we have one file per frame, an Alembic cache file per frame. Which is great, that's what we want, a standard f file format. We can import it uh, without any plugins or anything. It used to be the case that RealFlow only outputs uh, its proprietary bin format, and then you would be dependent on their uh, import plugin, which was, I mean, it worked, but it was not great, honestly. Um, the kind of, uh, the, 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 the catch, with this though is a lot of renderers are not really keen on switching alembic frames between frames uh, so you might want to bake this down to a single alembic for the entire sequence it just so happens that the nature of how real for uh, processes this it gets output into singular frames but that's pretty easy actually with a built-in tool uh, so if you go to the tools menu and stitch alembic in the center there you pretty
pretty much only needs, it's by default going to go to your product folder. And just go to your meshes folder and select all of them and open them. Give them an output file. Uh, and I'm just going to call them second mesh01. And it's going to be alembic. And stitch. And that's it, really. So it's going to start stitching for me. And uh, when it's done, we're going to see uh, we're going to see uh, that in the log down here. And let's keep an eye just in the project folder. This is one of the cases where you know this is not tip like the typical functionality, so it is pretty like it's a nodal thing like when you pick this then it takes focus from the entire program and it's just going to be frozen until the stitch is ready but uh, as far as I've used it it's been pretty stable to be honest uh, just to verify that nothing is going wrong you can always just like open the folder and keep an eye on that file and uh, I'll just do this I'll just uh, sort, sort by size and I can see that it's growing, and that pretty mu much just means that it's working. So as I'm hitting F5, this number keeps updating. And if it would for a long time be stuck without uh, become re becoming responsive again in the interface, if this would be stuck at, a, at some value for a long time, then I guess I would assume that uh, the app is kind of frozen on me. And this is going to be a lot more easier to handle for pretty much any any 3D app um, on a Lambic file, uh, unless you're using something really redundant, honestly. Um, <coughs> so you can uh, you could end up with a pretty huge uh, file here. Let's see, 60 by uh, 500. So it should be around a 30 gig file. Uh, but honestly, that's uh, I don't see a problem with that. It's not going to be. Uh, it's not going to be a problem handling that type of data. Uh, that should be fine. So I'm going to let this uh, cook for now, and we'll come back and we'll look at the preview uh, when I've let it run overnight, and uh, we'll also take a look at importing this mesh into Maya in my case, uh, and just taking a look at the possibilities in there. So I can see that my my alembic file has stopped growing and if I go back to real flow I can see that it says stitching files done so I'm pretty much done with it so uh, let's uh, see what it looks like in my so I'm gonna import the alembic now uh, want to make sure if you aren't already uh, using Alembic, uh, you want to make sure in the plugin manager that you have ABC export, ABC import loaded, uh, or just import in this case. And I'm going to go cache Alembic, cache import Alembic. And I'll just browse to my project. and import it. Might take a second because it's a big file, but it's going to be able to read it in a, in a structured way so it doesn't chunk up all the memory. It shouldn't be, you know, it doesn't need to load in all the 26 megs uh, in memory because it's a sparse data format. So it should be fine. <coughs> So yeah, there we go. So let's jump a few frames ahead. Find a nice frame to work with. Okay, so I'm just going to give myself uh, a standard uh, range of material here. 
and I'm going to pick uh, pretty much a, uh, one of the defaults of presets. And I'm going to stick a plane here. Not a disk, but a plane. And the zero of the scene. And I was ju just want to give it something to reflect. So uh, this is also going to get a redshift material. And in color, I just map it to a grid, I think. Yes, this is nice to look at. Um, maybe flip the tables. And give it a lot more squares. Something like that, maybe. And we'll also tone down the width. There we have something, and I also want to give uh, this an angle so that we can actually see what it's kicking up. Um, let's uh, let's maybe do some kind of sun light here and uh, have that sunlight kick up. A reflection. Here we go, now we can, I just made some very simple material properties. And let's just frame the shot and uh, stick a render here. Uh, so I'm just gonna, I'm probably just gonna use this, the, the perspective camera, to be honest. It's a resolution gate. Something like this. So here we have the finished preview. I let it run overnight and calculated. Uh, I just skipped out of the last two seconds, pretty much. Um, and all in all, it's looking pretty good, I have to say. Um, pretty uh, interesting movement around uh, the feet and the legs and the kind of swirls that linger there afterwards. I guess my main objection is uh, like when and they collide with the invisible wall. So obviously that's something we could have done differently. And there's a bit of um, jittering going on still. So that's something that we would have to combat. Not necessarily in these areas, because they would probably not be meshed anyway. Uh, but you can see some popping uh, up top here. I don't want to draw too many conclusions from this, because you'll see the, the striped uh, pattern, uh, I think, one of the, I think the material that I picked in the Maxwell settings probably wants to emulate kind of a foam and that's not really suitable in this case we're not calculating any type of information like that so we probably should have picked just a clear shader but we can take a look at that inside of the uh, inside of the Maya render which is more closer to the final result what I wanted to do here is just get an idea of like how does the splashy areas uh, behave, how does uh, the detail after the motion is starting to uh, dissipate, how is that behaving, and um, just seeing that there's no no major issues, some issues, but um, you know we're, we're feeling we're feeling good. Alright, so last but not least, we have um, 
the two previews or uh, renders side by side, I uh, went ahead and uh, set up a really uh, quick and dirty just a sun and sky lighting in Redshift and a basic, pr pretty much just a water preset material. Uh, and that's about it. Um, so uh, I was able to find a, an angle for the sunlight, which allowed us to see, you know, the, the shape of, of uh, the profile of the splashes, so to speak, which I really like. It's bringing out the details. Uh, and we can see now that uh, whatever um, concerns we had at this stage, that uh, the result was going to be not great. Uh, we can uh, we can relax uh, now. Uh, there is some kind of like I don't know if I should call them like flickering, but uh, if you look in the in these areas, uh, far away from the action, I would say that this would pass as uh, you know normal kind of ripple things, especially in this kind of lighting. If you look at the water, there's flickers going on everywhere, so. That would be okay. So other things that we could have done differently, I guess. If you take a look at what's going on here, um, obviously we could have taken it further uh, when it comes to tweaking the size of the droplets. Uh, they're pretty big and I rendered it first uh, without motion blur and they kind of, well you can actually actually see that in this preview. Uh, it kind of gives a, a bit of a gluey uh, appearance. Uh, there's actually some motion blur here too, but it kind of gives you know like a gluey appearance when they f freeze in in space and they're big just crystal spheres pretty much. Uh, the other thing, of course, be having particles bounce on visible walls, which but that's that's just the nature of the entire sim, right? Uh, we could have we could have had just um uh, like a recess, like a real pool. Uh, and let them fly off to the side and die when they exit the screen. Or we could have just modeled, you know, like a glass window type of thing. But that's really not the point here. Um, that's really not the point here. I added a few uh, color corrections, uh, some ridiculous uh, sunlight glow on the highlights, but that just looks nice, doesn't it? Uh, and I hope you can agree with me as well that uh, once you add motion blur, that really brings it home. Um, so I just wanted to kind of conclude here uh, what we've gone through. Obviously, this was a heavily unscripted and just a quick glance or a crash course. Uh, as promised, though, uh, I told you this was going to be this was going to be fast. Uh, we haven't really gone in depth, but we've taken a look at some of the some of the settings we need to be aware of when we're bringing animations from a 3D package into RealFlow, setting up our first Diverso sim, connecting them up in the relationship editor. Uh, tweaking collision distances for a mesh, uh, tweaking interaction between mesh and an object, uh, gradually up-pressing, uh, simulating, resetting, uh, file management, uh, and also uh, command line simulation, really powerful stuff there. Uh, do use that, uh, honestly, that's going to save a lot of headaches. Uh, we've seen how to mesh, uh, we've seen how to test render inside of Maxwell, and uh, just export the mesh and um, so you can bring it into your 3D package. I will say one thing though, one, one kind of like um, one uh, error that I made. I was telling you about, I was showing you how to output Alembic files and then stitch it together to one Alembic and I was going to render that in Maya but I was just not able to get a motion blur on it. Uh, I think this is actually a limitation when it comes to outputting Alembic from RealFlow for Diverso and Standard Particles. Um, I'm kind of bummed out about it actually because obviously we want to use uh, Alembic if we can and uh, also we want those uh, channels, we, we, we need those channels, at least verticity, velocity, that type of thing. Uh, the thing is I've always used that in context with Hybrido and it seems like the setup for Hybrido and for uh, Diverso is different according to what I could find like on the forums. Um, so when you export a hybrid mesh, which is something we'll get into once we get to the individual breakdowns of the, of the letters, um, then you can actually enable velocity vorticity, things like that. But here, if we go to particle mesh, select that, oh, 
honestly you don't have to have it selected sorry you can go to export uh, export central or press F12 this is the place where you can get a I mean, you don't have to go in here, but this is where you go if you want to change settings, like what type of file format do you want to export for my particles, for my mesh control, which nodes are doing what in terms of I.O. Uh, so I'm going to go down to the particle meshes VDB. And previously we had uh, ABC, Lembic. And in this case, what I did uh, was I enabled the mesh cache instead. Um, and that just gives you a bunch of bin files, but when you're inside of Maya, uh, you can use uh, you can use RealFlow's own importer. Uh, so let's take a look at that. So here we have uh, a Maya session, and here we have RealFlow's own importer uh, or the shelf from RealFlow. It comes with RF Connect, which is a product that you get as a licensee, um, and it really just a far right button here is going to give you if you look at the tooltip um, import a bin mesh. So rather than using the built-in tools uh, to import a, a Lemic mesh, which is a standard file format, you use the RealFlow uh, 1 in order to um, import a proprietary format. And once you do that, you'll see that it has a RealFlow mesh source. And this one takes care of all of, um, uh, you know, it makes sure that you can do motion blur pretty much. I'm going to keep investigating into this and maybe I'll do a separate video or something like that. But uh, I had to kind of back up on, on what I said previously in the video. And in order to get that final um, render with motion blur, this was all very frustrating to me. Uh, I didn't know that was the case or maybe I had I knew, but I'd forgotten about it. So I had to do that in order to um, get motion blur. Maybe this is something we can follow up on. You know, there's a bunch of tools inside of RealFlow that can be used to kind of wrangle data. Maybe we can do some kind of work around uh, running it through, you know, a batch uh, script or something like, or a batch graph, something like that. There are these uh, batch, obviously there's Python, and there's also bat batch graphs, uh, which you can, which is kind of like a node-based programming thing where you can do things like um, snap particles, foam particles to surface. Uh, you can um, you can do variable viscosity even though it's not available in the UI, things like that. So maybe, I don't know, maybe. Um, right, so um, I think we're about good to wrap it up here. I mean, I hope you, uh, my, my intention was to show you kind of like the flow from conceptualizing a pro project to setting it up to uppressing it, uh, to tackling some common issues and how to make it ready for output. Uh, and obviously we're gonna see a lot more different use cases when we get into the individual breakdowns. So if there's anything you think that I glanced over too quickly, um, feel free to give a comment below and, and let me know what you want, want me to elaborate on and I might be able to make a separate video or get back to you. Um, if, you uh, if you liked the video, then by all means, let all your friends who might be interested in learning RealFo know about it. Uh, and if you didn't like it, then let us know. And uh, I uh, hope that you want to stay tuned uh, since the following videos are going to be about uh, the individual letters. Uh, first of all, uh, obviously, if we go in the order of the alphabet, um, first of all, we're going to go to A for viscosity and then B is going to be a bit more of a hybrido. There's going to be magic and uh, there's going to be um, hybrido sims with secondary foam, uh, viscosity sims, magic, more magic, more squishy parts. Um, there's going to be fracture dynamics, gooey stuff, blending different densities, ocean waves, boiling effects, you name it. Uh, pretty much the whole spectrum. So I hope I'll see you uh, in the upcoming videos and thanks so much again for watching this one.